Welcome to this session, Positive Parenting, Tips for Homeschooling Families. My name is Jana Cook, and I'm the Community Manager of Bookshark. Today, I'm joined with Jill Jackson, a professional counselor. Welcome, Jill. Thank you for having me. I'd love for you to go ahead and start by telling our viewers a little bit about yourself. Okay. Uh, like you said, my name is Jill Jackson, and I am a counselor at a private practice in Castle Rock, Colorado. I primarily see teens and women, um, and with teens, I also happen to do family work, um, communication, um, a lot of parenting tips and techniques as well when it comes to those interactions. Um, I am also a mom of three, so I have got a seven-year-old, a five-year-old, and a 16-month-old as well. That's full plate you've got there, Jill. Yes, yes, <laughs> yes, it is. You're definitely in the trenches of parenting, not only professionally, but personally. So I think that may help our viewers feel a little bit more comfortable knowing that even though a, you're a professional, you still are dealing with being a parent at the same time. Oh, absolutely. And I had to, you know, in working for, in preparing for our talk today, I had to just remind myself that I don't have these things down perfectly and it is a continual practice for me as well. Um, but it's just so helpful to have those reminders um, and just the support when we need it, like you said, in the trenches. I know that um, as we sit around the dinner table, even now with um, our twins that are 15, they will bring up some parenting issues that, that we had when they were toddlers or in their elementary years. And um, I just feel like I have to agree with them. Like, you're right. I didn't do that the right way. Or I've learned better with your younger sibling. So that's why she's probably going to turn out a little bit better than you guys. But <laughs> so thank you. <laughs> yes, absolutely. Yeah, that's definitely part of it. So for our audience who may be first time homeschoolers um, or maybe pandemic homeschoolers is something that we've heard um, out there in the world of homeschooling. One of the things that I have repeatedly seen in comments is parents are really struggling, struggling with this 24 seven parenting that they have found themselves in. Before you could parent in the morning, send your kids to school, bring them back home and parent at night. And now you're parenting from the time you open your eyes till the time they close their eyes. So let's just start off by talking about this idea of the pandemic and how it switched us from being, you know, kind of distanced from our children for a while to 100% all the time. Yeah. It's a huge challenge. I would say it's one of the biggest challenges that I see on the kids side of things as well, you know, they struggle as well. They are missing that break that they get from their parents. They are missing um, the other interaction that they continually get. And it's just a reality for us as humans, too much, too much with something is too much of a good thing, right? Often is. So, you know, it's just the reality. And so it's trying to break up the normal, um, trying to, you know, create divisions throughout the day, create separation where we can, you know, and so much of what we're talking about today is going to be age dependent with these kiddos. You know, obviously you can't expect your four-year-old to independently do all of their work by themselves. Um, but hopefully today, you know, we will get some practical tips on how do we really create the um, intentional breaks, the changing up the routine to keep things not feeling just mundane and challenging and difficult for everybody involved. I know when I first started homeschooling my kids, I was under the illusion that the sun was going to rise and the birds were going to chirp and everything was just going to fall in line. And my plan for the day was going to go off without a hitch. And then, then my kids woke up and I'm, I'm in the reality of it. Right. And so I think the first question that I asked myself is what am I doing wrong as a parent? Hmm. that I, I'm finding that my um, illusion of what it should be is not lining up with the reality of what I'm living. Hmm. Yeah, that's a great question. And it can sound like a harsh question. And so maybe even with that question itself, it's reorienting how we view that. It's not maybe that you're always doing something wrong. Um, are you expecting too much? Are you trying to adhere too rigidly to a schedule? Are you sticking to those expectations that you think your child should rise to? Is that realistic? Um, is that practical? And all that really does is create disappointment for you, hardship for you. And so I, again, 
maybe it's not necessarily what am I doing wrong? It's where do I need to reorient? Um, where does my perspective need to shift? And these are kind of individual questions for families because your homeschooling challenges may look different than mine and may look different than the next person's as well. And so this really comes from some introspection within families of saying, okay, where, where does the conflict seem to rise? Um, what is my kid pushing back with, you know, is their learning style different than what I'm trying to teach with. So there's got to be some more flexibility. Um, that curriculum you have in front of you, it is a wonderful guide. It is not a, an, an equation for success for everybody. We have to adapt, we have to change and modify things to fit ourselves and to fit our kids' needs. Um, so really, I think the best question for parents to ask would be, you know, what are my goals? Um, what should my kids' goals be? And then how do we need to reevaluate that? Um, what are you desiring to see with your children, with your family? And how can you work around those goals and desires? Again, within the realistic expectation realm. Um, another thing that plays into this is we are all busy. Even, even families who have decided to do homeschooling and they know all of the work that implies, there's still things to be done. Um, you don't just get the whole day to just sit down and do homeschooling. So that's another reevaluation that has to take place too. Are you hurrying through everything? Are you rushing? Are you trying to just get it done, go from step to step to step? This is really a time where you have to expect to slow down, um, where you have to be able to pause when you need to, when things aren't going well, and you've got to remind yourself, it's a marathon, it's not a sprint. Um, and so how do you help yourself slow that pace down so that everybody around you can feel like they can do the same? I definitely feel that um, this idea of a marathon, I, I feel like maybe this school year kind of started last March when the pandemic hit the United States and it's kind of continued even until these now, like we're 13 months later into it. So definitely some fatigue that I personally was not expecting. And this is my fifth year homeschooling. Yeah. So that, that kind of surprised me that nothing with our curriculum necessarily changed, but because of everything else around, I forgot to um, give myself and my children grace during this time, because I just think, well, we should be able to move on to the next thing and, yeah. you know, buck it up. Nothing has changed within these four walls, but that's so unrealistic because so much has changed right. within these four walls because we're being pressured by what's outside of the four walls. And I forget that as a parent so easily, and it does make things go a little rougher at times. Absolutely. Yeah. All right. So we're not asking the question of what I'm doing wrong, but maybe reevaluating the expectation. So my next question would be, um, how do I get my kids to listen to me? <laughs> yes, that is a wonderful question. And again, if you know, if we had an equation <laughs> for that, I think you'd be making a lot of money. Um, there are definitely some helpful tips, you know, for how we can get our kids to listen to us. The first piece is to realize they are kids. Um, my husband always still has to remind me when it comes to my now five-year-old who he just turned five, just think of him like a puppy, right? He's just a puppy. He's going to mess up. He's going to sprint from thing to thing. It's hard to have that focus. And I have to remind myself he's five. Uh, he's a five-year-old boy. And so again, it's those expectations for me. I can't expect him to be an adult. I can't expect him to have all of the behaviors that I would love for him to have when he is a grown man. Um, that is still a work in progress. So I have to adapt how I parent and try to talk to him, all of my kids. The first thing would be you know, to get on his level. I have to completely rem always remind myself to get on my kids' level. When you've got little ones, it, it's a totally different experience when we are up here talking down to them. They know when we're upset. It can do so much to crouch down, pull up a chair, whatever it is to get on that same eye level with them. It's, it's letting them know you're on the level playing field. You're willing to come down and to speak with them. Um, and there are a couple of things, you know, that just 
beyond the being on the same level, it forces you to pause, right? You can't just turn around, snap something, go back to something else. You have to intentionally pause. You have to make time for that interaction to happen. And it's also, it's a one-on-one -on -one communication that tells your kid that they are worth your time, that they are worth communicating with. Um, and so that is probably the biggest piece to start a conversation. Get on their level. It's going to force you to pause. It's going to force you to think before you talk. Um, it's going to engage your child in a way that's just different than you speaking down to them. Um, try as hard as we can. This is one I have to remind myself all the time is to do away with don't and no as much as we can. Um, this isn't a, you know, I'm saying let everything slide and let everything go, but it's that reminder, and I've had to remind myself this so much, how often I say no, how often my immediate reaction is negative, is don't do that. Um, the negative commands that we give actually requires children to double process. So not only are they having to think about what they're not supposed to be doing, which we're telling them, they now have to engage and try to come up with themselves what they should do instead. Um, and for me and my kids, boy, I don't have, I don't want them to have to process more than they already are because that's already frustrating enough for me to watch the processing happening. So if I can help that, if I can give a positive instruction, um, that's going to tell them what they can just go ahead and do. They know what I'm wanting from them. They know what that expectation is and they don't have to deal with the negative side of it as well. Um, so it's, instead of it's a you know, don't hit your brother, don't touch your brother. It's, hey, can we use gentle touches when we're playing with our brother? Um, you know, don't leave your toys all over the floor. Hey, please put your toys in the toy bin. That's a, here's an instruction. Here's what I want you to do with it. Um, rather than again, expecting them to do that double processing. Um, something that goes along with this is the saying yes, when you can, right? Um, this is going to tell your kids that you are open, that you want the things that they want for themselves, that you are on their side as much as you can be. Obviously, this isn't practical all the time, right? Um, but it's reorienting when you're sitting, kids are sitting there and can we go to the park? And you know, right at that moment, you guys cannot make it to the park, but it doesn't have to be a no answer. It can be a, hey, the park sounds great. Could we make a plan to do that on Friday or Saturday? So it's a, yeah, I like your idea. I want to do what you want to do. Here's the options for it. Um, so you're saying no, right, in the moment without saying no. And it's letting your kids know, okay, again, it's not that negative processing. Um, there's more of a positive connection that can be happening there with your kids. Um, that helps them listen to you. Because then again, if they have something to look forward to, there's gonna be less of that arguing. There's gonna be less of maybe that fit throwing that they didn't get their way. Um, they'll then have a motivator. They'll have a goal. They'll have something to work towards. Um, they'll be excited for what's coming. Um, another practical piece is to shorten our speech. Again, this is one I continually have to remind myself with. Um, communication is so important. I think it's one of the biggest things is we need to communicate, but we need to be very tactful with our communication. Again, knowing your children and even teenagers, they don't want you to sit down and have a 40 minute lecture with them, right? They're engaged for about a couple minutes of that time and then they're checked out and then they're frustrated and then you're wasting their time. And it's the same, we know that with our little kids, their attention spans are so short. So absolutely communicate intentionally communicate, shorten that up. Um, so instead of, you know, this long speech you want to give your kids, make it as short as possible. The highlights, right? The cliffs notes for what we want to get across to our kids, knowing that they're only going to process so much, they're only going to listen so much. Um, say thank you in advance to your kids. So this is another positive way to help them do what you're looking for them to do. Um, trying to get them to listen to you. If you're asking them to do something, um, or if you're just go out, you see a towel sitting on the floor right after a shower. I feel like that's every day with my daughter. It's instead of walking in her room and saying, Elise, you left the towel on the floor again, right? That, that's a negative that, that makes her feel bad. There's going to be some pushback with that. I walk in the door and go, Hey, thanks for um, hanging up your towel when you get a minute, right? It's a, that tells her that 
I'm trusting that you're going to do something I know I've already asked you to do. And that's giving her the opportunity to listen without having to be told exactly what to do, if that makes sense. Um, and then, you know, another helpful piece would just be to, I have to do this with my boys, especially it, make sure that they heard you, right? Um, my boys, sometimes my husband, right? Uh, without being condescending and like, hey, did you hear what I said? I wanna make sure that he got what I was asking of him or what, he, what I was trying to communicate to him. Um, so it's just, once you've made eye contact, we've shortened our speech, we've explained what they want them to do. Just, hey, could you remind me what I just asked you to do? Could you tell me what you heard me ask you to do? Right to our kids, give them the opportunity to respond. Um, that makes them have to process even more, right? And engage in that and then own it as well. They were able to verbalize it. They know what they need to do rather than the excuse I hear sometimes is, I didn't hear you say that, right? They can't say that if I have them repeat it and I know that they heard it. Um, so, you know, those are some very practical points. I don't feel like probably any of this is new to parents, but it's that reminder for all of us. Um, we get in very habitual communication patterns, parenting styles, um, how we handle conflict. And so it's just kind of reevaluating. It's trying to make an effort here or there. It's practice. It's practice, practice, practice. It's when I yell at my kid to do something or I see him not listening, I've got to take that moment and say, okay, how can I phrase this, right? In one of these ways we just talked about where I'm gonna get the best response from him that I can. Um, it's making those observations to our kiddos instead of those negative comments. So, hey, I see that jacket on the floor. Um, or what's your plan for getting that assignment done today? Um, it's, you see a problem, right? And then making an observation about it and, and getting them to engage and coming up with a plan themselves, maybe helping them to make a plan. It's, it's part of a conversation rather than just that standing up authority, talking down negative, right? We're, that is where we get the most offensive response back to us. Well, I feel like you're speaking directly to my, to myself about my 15 year old. Um, the other evening she came home from work and I said, please make sure you clean up after yourself in the kitchen. So I go into the kitchen and I see dishes in the sink and I, in a sing song voice, cause that's where I go when I try not to yell. I said, mm -hmm. who, who, you know, are these your dishes? She said, well, I cleaned up. I said, did you? Because there's dishes in the sink. She said, you didn't say put my dishes in the dishwasher. Mm -hmm. You said, clean up the kitchen Yeah. and the counters are clean. Yeah. And in that moment, I I wanted to be mad, but I, I listened to what her words were. And I was like, are you purposely jacking with me and doing everything <laughs> except what I asked you to do within yeah. the boundaries of what I asked you to do? And honestly, if she is, I believe it's subconscious, like, but in her mind, she really did. She didn't leave the kitchen a mess. And yeah. so she felt good about that. And I, I'm fuming, but then I had to laugh because I'm like, either you're the next Einstein or I'm going to lose it. <laughs> so <laughs> natural gift children have to, um, to push exactly <laughs> where we don't even know our buttons are sometimes. Yeah. Now this same child, I have learned that I can't, it's a joke in the house. Like she doesn't get told no, because mm. we know that even from a very small child, no would set her off down a tailspin and yeah. and I never realized why until yeah. I came to the revelation of well that's that's negative in her mind and she doesn't like anything negative she does she doesn't know what to do with negativity so mm -hmm. it's always like maybe I'll think about that yeah give me a chance to process that and I'll get back to you yeah. and then yeah. she's fine and her twin sister's like why don't you ever just tell her no I'm like mm, I've learned that doesn't bode well for either of us yeah. And it seems permissive, but I'm actually not giving her permission to do anything. I'm actually giving myself permission to take a breath, to process what she's asking me. And if it isn't in that moment, then at least I can put it off and say, well, we maybe tomorrow, or let's look at that. Let's come back to that in a little bit. Yeah. It works wonders. And she's yeah. 15. Oh, absolutely. You brought up a great point too, is you've got twins, right? Which seemingly should be very similar when it comes to parenting, but 
you know, we have to respond to our kids differently. We know their needs. Um, and that comes from that observation, right? We've got to observe um, how our kids respond well. And that might be very different from one to the next. Um, and so it can't be a one size fits all parenting. Um, it, it has to be adaptable. And when it looks permissive to her twin, I then have to stop and take her aside and say, when you have twins, I can't wait to step in and parent with you, but mm -hmm. you need to understand that what works for her doesn't work for you. And right. it doesn't mean that we love her more or love you less. Right. We are just making it work for everybody in our household. Yeah. And yeah. thankfully she is um, more agreeable. And so just that little pep talk from the side <laughs> sideline, she's usually okay with it after that. Yeah. That's so good. Yeah. So you have encouraged us as parents. I, I do find it ironic that whenever we're trying to figure out how to navigate our children's behavior, it tends to come back to what we need to do to change. And I find that as a parent, sometimes very frustrating because I just want them to change and I shouldn't have to change. But I think being a good parent is realizing where you need to change. Um, so for homeschooling parents who are looking for change. They are looking for ways to inspire their children, to motivate them, to get them to do their schoolwork, because that is a real struggle for parents right now. Yeah, absolutely. You know, one of the biggest things I've seen this year with the pandemic um, is giving your children as much expectancy as possible. And that that's not always practical, right? We can't iron out every minute of the day. Um, and actually some children don't prefer that, but it's, it's knowing that with this year, there have been so many changes, so many losses, um, so much back and forth. So if they can expect something, if they can rely on something, there's going to be a security and a comfortability there. Um, and so that practically looks like you know, a schedule um, that looks like clear, ironed out expectations um, that might even be rules, you know, and if your kids are visual learners, put these things on boards, you know, um, I pulled, I'm going see if maybe I can share my screen with you, Jana, if that's okay. Yeah. Um, just a super simple example of a, um, of a board that you can create with your kids. Um, Oh, let's see. Okay, we see this. Mm -hmm. um, so this would be a super simple example that one that would even probably work well for little kids who maybe can't even read yet because you've got the kind of pictures on there for them. Um, you know, so you've got Max's choices and that's a great thing to see is that it's choices, right? It's not a step-by-step, -step, here's the order in which we're gonna do everything. Um, this is gonna be, hey, look, these are your choices. What are you choosing to work on right now? right? Um, and it's setting time limits on those. Again, you're going to know your kids if they can work in 20 minute increments or hour increments. Um, I'll set my timer for 20 minutes. What are you going to choose to work on first? They get to grab a sticky note from that corner. Um, they get to put that in that middle category there. This is what I'm currently doing, right? And then when they're done, they get to move it over to that done column and they will tangibly get to see the movement there, what they've accomplished, what still needs to be done. And even that reminder, maybe when they're in process of, okay, this is what I'm still doing. Um, and they'll have that, those time limits that you've set up for them as well. Um, so this would be a good example of expectancy. This is Here's what we've got on our plate today. Here's what we need to do. Getting them involved in um, some of that choice element of it. They can choose practically what they'd like to be doing at the time. Um, and then they get to move those sticky notes themselves, get a sense of accomplishment there. Um, you know, something else that works really well um, is to just introduce and be mindful of the breaks that you're introducing, getting them again involved. And maybe at the beginning of the day, when you guys are talking out what the day is gonna look like, what would you like to do today for your breaks in between subjects, for your breaks in between when you need a break? Is that it's a beautiful day outside, can you run around the backyard? Um, is it playing in the hose? Is it, you know, 
reading, beads, whatever that is, it's going to make them feel like they have something to look forward to. Um, they know it's coming in those breaks times. It's going to be more motivating for them to get through an assignment to get to that, what they're looking forward to. Um, and then getting to the, remind them as well of when those breaks are. Again, I think sometimes we get hung up on, we expect them to sit down, work diligently for an hour, and then there's that frustration when we see them off task um, or not being committed to that. So that's a good moment for you to say, okay, am I expecting practical things from them? Can I make breaks more regular? Would that really mess with our schedule so much if, instead of, you know, if we did 20 minute increments with five minute breaks in between? Can you work that into your schedule so it feels more doable for you and your children? Um, something that goes along with those lines is, you know, do you practically need to have an assessment with your child? Is that something that you can do or is that something you can have done to make sure that your child is on the level they're supposed to be? Because there's a difference between children um, pushing back and not wanting to do the work or the work being legitimately too advanced for them, too much for them. You know, so that's something we continually need to be evaluating. Is this age appropriate? Is this skill level appropriate work that I have for them? Um, once you can rule out, okay, my child is fully capable of doing this work, then that can help you and make you feel more confident to set boundaries where they need to be set um, to maybe work in different time increments and things like we discussed. Um, something along those lines as well is to have a, have a talk with your kids about what their strengths and weaknesses are. This is super practical and helpful and everybody should do this, homeschooling or not, because adults need this. Um, you know, a lot of adults have had to figure that out on their own. If that was something they realized from an early age, they would be able to cater to their strengths. Um, they would be able to know when a subject, when something is more of a weakness of theirs, and then they'll be able to proactively get help. Um, and it's not seen as a negative thing. A good way to engage this conversation is to introduce your own strengths and weaknesses into the conversation. So they see that it's not something that doesn't need to be talked about. It's not a bad thing to discuss. Um, you know, mine would be math. Listen, I am, math is not my strong suit and that's okay. I did not go into profession with math, um, but that is something that I can still try to do. I just need to make sure I've got all the tools I need and the people around me who can help me succeed in that. Um, so definitely even younger kids can participate in these discussions. They're probably well aware of what they would see as their weaknesses, um, helping them to see that those are things that they can still work with and work on. And they've got support through you in those areas as well. Um, you know, positive reinforcement is probably the best thing you can do throughout the day to keep motivation going when it comes to schoolwork. So come up with your own reward system. You know, for younger kids, this might look like, you know, little pencils or erasers or stickers, you know, sticker charts, something like that for older kids. Maybe that looks like more time on a computer game or, or phone time. You know, obviously those are things that you guys need to discuss and your kids can be involved in that discussion as well. You know, what would you like as rewards? You know, I want to, I want to show you how proud I am of you that you are continuing to work so hard what would make you feel rewarded? What would make you feel like you've been doing a good job? Engage them, let them have some say in that so that they are excited about those rewards and they feel that throughout the day. Um, and so that's just a constant reminder for you, for us as parents, that as you see your kids, man, if they worked until that buzzer, please reward them, let them know that they, they nailed it, um, that that was 20 minutes of hard work that they just accomplished. Um, the more they feel like they are accomplishing, the more willing they'll be to continue to work. Um, and then uh, when it comes to that workspace, and this is very hard when it comes to our homes because I'm sure we all have every area of our home filled and has its own purpose, but that designated workspace for kids, um, making them feel like they've got a space to do their work, um, a space where they can set things aside. It's distraction free, relatively speaking, for the most part, um, and they will feel encouraged to just continue 
to be in that space and they know that that's their work zone, right? They don't need to bring their toys in that area. Um, it just helps even us as adults, we know this, it, it doesn't work well to have everything in your bedroom. You've gotta have those designated spaces. Um, something we've talked a little bit about already is that knowing your kid's style of learning. Are they a hands-on learner? Are they an audio learner? Are they a visual learner? Um, and adapting you know, the teaching, the curriculum, and even the home things around that, having the boards up for your visual learners, for your hands-on learners, for them being able to move things and know what they need to be working on, how they've accomplished those things. Um, for your audio learners, can you find that book on a tape that they can listen to? Um, so it's, you can work on the same curriculum and you can work around that in several different areas to cater to your kids' needs. Um, and I would say probably the best thing to work towards as homeschooling parents would be independent working, right? I think that is the ultimate goal for parents is that our kids would work independently on things. I think that's definitely attainable, but you've got to have that in your mindset as you are practically implementing these things. And again, those expectations, recognizing that you cannot expect your five-year-old to have a full independent workday, um, but you can help him work towards that. You can help him work on, here's everything you need to succeed in this assignment, right? I'll be over here if you need me. I would love for you to challenge yourself and see if you can get through it on your own, right? Little things at a time to build their confidence and in independence in working. I have found myself as a parent kind of pushing back toward that positive reinforcement. I think part of it is our generation that we didn't get it. So why should you? Um, and so, but as I was listening to you talk, I thought, my goodness, you're right. We know what we do wrong all day long and we can focus on the negative in ourselves without somebody else pointing it out, but to hear outside of us, somebody pointing out the positive, um, it just makes all the difference in the world. It's just switching my mindset to, you know, do better. You can do better with your kids than it was done with you. Right. And I don't know why it's, I don't know if I'm the only one out there that I'm resistant to that. It's very hard for me, but I am trying to do better and notice those things. Um, and I do see a world of difference when I take the steps to be intentional with pointing out what they've done really well. I don't know why that's not more natural. Hmm. Yeah. I think, you know, part of our roles as mothers is to, you know, we, we push, we want our kids to grow and we do have those built-in expectations. Um, but how much more likely are we to do something that we get praise for and encouragement for, and it's actually enjoyable than if we sit down and it's just a task and it is pressed and there is anger around it. I mean, there's always going to be pushback with that. And even for us as adults. So absolutely. I, that is one that I have to continually reorient as well. Um, Cause it is, it just, it comes so much more naturally, sadly, um, to discourage or to press than to encourage. I think I need to start now putting sticky notes for myself around the house too. <laughs> Do a little chart. Yeah. Yes. Like, and then, and then when I do it, I can put it into my next column because <laughs> like, I'm going to positively reinforce myself to positively reinforce my children. Yeah. I mean, and that's whatever a, it takes. Yeah. That's a great point. You know, we do model, um, we exhibit what we have been shown, right? And, and our kids, sadly enough, they exhibit what they have been shown as well. And so a lot of times those fingers point back at us. And so, yeah, if we can model encouragement to ourselves, of, you know, hopefully that will trickle down naturally. Jill, I'm slightly disappointed because so far all the suggestions that you've given me have been about changing my behavior. And so I really <laughs> thought you were going to be able to come on and, and just give me some magic hacks to get my children to behave the way I needed them to. But yeah. unfortunately, it's just not the case. Yes. But we shouldn't be discouraged with that because the huge because is that if we know anything, it's that it is very hard for us to control other people. Um, we can't control our children. We can try, um, but we can control ourselves for the most part, and that's the goal. So if we can modify, if we can adapt, if we can control ourselves in these areas, um, then that is how we will see the greatest change and growth through our kids. 
So I think you kind of already answered then, like, how do I stop yelling at my kids? I think it's <laughs> being mindful yeah. of, of controlling ourselves. So do you have some tips to help parents in that area? Yes. And, um, you know, I shared with you a little bit before this, that this was a, <laughs> Um, speaking loudly to my five-year-old before jumping on and, and talking about this. So again, I hope that's encouraging and not discouraging because it is a, it's a practice. Um, it's not, it's not a perfection. Um, and so we're going to fail. We are going to raise our voice. Um, it's just, it's how we respond to that in that moment that will teach our children and, and it will teach us at, at the same time with that. Um, so I think we can all, if we are honest, know how yelling is received with our kids. We very rarely get positive results with yelling. At least I don't. Um, when we yell at our children, it is a natural instinct for them to shut down. It's a defense mechanism. They, they tune it out, they block it out. Um, they respond negatively themselves, and then we'll often see them yelling as well. Um, so again, it's knowing, it's knowing the why, right? Why, why not yell? There are many, many reasons, but, but probably mostly because it doesn't really help. It doesn't really make anything better. Um, so the biggest thing I think to start for us is to know, know your triggers, right? Know when you are already at a nine and it's gonna take very little to push you to that 10. Um, know if you've already had a very full day and you've still got dinner to cook, that if somebody comes up and grabs my leg, I, it will not go well for them, right? And so how can we be proactive there? If I know that I am prone to start yelling at the end of the day when I have to make dinner, um, when we are in a hurry, when I have things to, if I've got plans that I have, if I've got people coming over, um, if I'm trying to get my kids out the door for whatever it is, I know that those are my trigger points. And so I need to be more proactive going into those things to say, okay, what can I do to, can I get stuff out the night ahead? Can I have my kids get things ready and by the door the night ahead? So they just have to get up, eat food, walk out the door. Um, can I have something cooking in the crock pot? during the day. So it's not a 5.30 PM rush for dinner. Um, can I slowly chip away at that to-do list during the day? So it's not all at the end of the day. It, it's a self-awareness that requires, that we require for ourselves to know what those triggers are. Um, and, and feel like you are able and willing to give your kids warning. So, you know, I will oftentimes let my kids know, hey, mommy has had a long day. I'm letting you know. I'm close, right? Like, please don't push it. Um, and it will take a little bit, but I think your kids will learn that, right? They, where they might be quicker to jump on your case, maybe now that they've had that warning, they maybe know they're not supposed to. Um, this also comes with a clear communication and establishment of rules and consequences ahead of time too. Because in that moment, if they've done something wrong, if I'm yelling at them, trying to teach them why it was wrong. And then I'm yelling at them, telling them what their consequences are. They're not receiving anything that I'm yelling. So if I know, if they know ahead of time, again, maybe for your visual learners, you've got like a rule board up in your house. And on the other side of it, you've got the consequences. Or maybe if it's been a really big challenge with some of your kids in the morning, it's part of your morning routine to talk about, hey, here are the rules again, right? A, B, and C, and let's go over what's going to happen if we break A, this happens. If we break B, this happens. Because then when it does happen, you don't have to go into teaching mode. You don't have to go into consequence explaining mode. It's very clear. They know it. Hey, you just hit your brother. We talked about that. You know what the consequence is for that. Please go do whatever it is. Um, it, it's easier. You're setting yourself up much easier. So you don't have to have that emotional response. You don't have to do that explaining and teaching time in that moment. Um, giving kids um, clear directives is well, right? So I would say probably one of the biggest ones for me, like I get the most fits if I've let them watch a 30 minute show and I'm going to turn it off, I know what's about to happen, right? But if I can give a warning ahead of time, hey, we've got five more minutes on this and then it's gonna be bedtime, right? It's, it's a clear directive. They can anticipate it, they can expect it. And I can also throw in their expectations about behavior, right? Um, this was your reward. 
you know, thank you guys for going and get ready for bed, right? That thank you, that positive encouragement ahead of time, that expectation for them. They have that clear directive in front of them. Um, following through is equally as important, right? I think that's probably what most commonly leads to yelling is we ask them to do something once, they don't listen. We ask them again, we then threaten something, then they don't do it, then it's yelling, right? So if we followed through the first time, we would save ourselves from the rest of those steps, right? So again, it's the clear rules, the clear expectations, and then following through so they know you mean it. So they know they can't push the boundary, push the boundary because kids naturally do that. They're gonna push the line as far as they can. They're gonna dip their toe over it. So if we follow through the first time, that they'll know we're serious about it. Um, and this takes time, right? We're jumping back to like the very first thing we talked about, it's knowing that we are gonna be forced to step away from something we're doing. It's knowing that we are gonna have to slow down. Um, it's knowing that that takes time to sit and follow through and make it a clear punishment or consequence or whatever it is. So knowing that ahead of time, not expecting them, um, not expecting them to just listen and be perfect or you get to get to complete your full workout that you had ahead of you. It's fully expecting that you're gonna to have to hit pause and step away in a moment. And being able to do that for right that greater good. If you are wanting your kids to listen, if you are wanting to have that positive relationship, if you're wanting to keep yourself from losing it, have that expectancy at the beginning of this, knowing that it's gonna take time, it's gonna take practice. Um, we've gotta be flexible with our expectations for ourselves, for our own time, right? Um, along with this, there are some times where we need to take a time out for ourselves, right? Personally, um, I will all, sometimes I'll just have to like step outside. I need a minute. Um, and that's okay. Um, go in your room, close the door if you can, right? Talk yourself through something, um, force yourself. Remember our talk of like getting down on your kid's level that intentionally creates a pause, right? Sometimes if we just had a pause, things wouldn't fly out of our mouth. Um, that tone wouldn't come out. So if we need to take that time out, if we need to train ourselves to count to five before we react to our kids, those five seconds can be such a great help. I'm in the kitchen. If it's not a dire emergency, right? If I see something, can I take a breath and can I count to three? It's gonna force me to pause. It's gonna force me to think about my words a little bit, my tone, how I'm about to react to. Sometimes we need those timeouts as well. I love uh, that you gave permission to just count to three because sometimes five is too long for me. I to say, uh, in my head, I was like, okay, I may not have five seconds, <laughs> but, but you three for sure. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And figure out what works for you, you know? Um, Another piece of this is accountability, right? When somebody else knows that we wanna start that, that diet or we wanna start that reading plan, whatever it is, we're more likely to follow through because we've got people asking about it. Um, so can you bring your partner in on this? Um, can you tell your mom what you are trying to do? Can you tell your kids? Um, it, it, uh, there is nothing more humbling than your kids holding you accountable and saying, mommy, you said you didn't want to yell at us today. Okay, thank you for that gentle reminder. Um, but it, it's helpful. It's helpful to have people partner with you in it, um, hold you accountable to it, and, and keep you on that track to continuing to practice, to fessing up. That being said, um, apologies go a long ways for ourselves, for our kids. Everything we are modeling it is, again, trying to help create that change in them as well. It's going to come from us. We usually handle conflict the way we saw it handled. Our kids usually handle conflict the way they see it modeled. And so if we can learn to communicate more, if we can learn to own up to, mommy should not have yelled at you just then. I got upset. That wasn't okay. I'm sorry. Do you forgive me? Um, your kids will see that humility, your kids will see, okay, it's okay, one, to mess up, it's human, we're all human, mommy's still human, um, and then it's okay to own up to it. We're trying to teach our children ownership of their own actions, um, their words, and then that they can, you know, change that behavior as well. Um, you know, with that as well, the, the expectations, knowing what's normal behavior, you know, our expectations from our four-year-old are gonna look different than our teenagers. 
Um, unfortunately, you know, the eye rolling from a nine-year-old, while we really may not like it, it is considered normal behavior. Um, they are trying to control a situation when they feel like they don't have a lot of control there, right? Our little kids, um, they tend to express their frustration physically, right? We have to engage that and teach that. They, we can't always just jump on the expression of that behavior. We have to start teaching to the emotions, getting them to recognize that anger buildup, getting them to learn how to express it in a healthy way. Um, so that all comes from us and engaging in that and communicating that and um, having time and making them feel like, I see your frustration, right? Letting, validating the emotions that we're not excusing it, right? Um, and we're not excusing the behavior, but it's saying, I know you're really frustrated right now. How can I help in this situation? How can I help your brother um, not destroy your tower, right? Like it's just engaging in that moment, that positive communication, um, starting to teach them to recognize the emotions, validating them, and then also having a healthy expression. Um, and that comes from us as well. Healthy expressions of our frustration, our anger, our emotion. Um, and that's practicing for us as well. I feel like we have just covered so much information that, um, I mean, I'm going to have to watch our session several times in order to process through all of it. And so um, just speak to our audience about how maybe just take one thing and work on it. Because I know personally, if I try to do a complete overhaul, it maybe will last a couple hours. I maybe can white knuckle it for a couple of days, but then it just, I'm an all or nothing kind of person. And I think in parenting, that's the, that's the improper attitude to have. I think that's good. I think a good motivator when it comes to counseling, when it comes to parenting, um, homeschooling, being goal oriented, being goal driven. And so for me as a parent, if my goal is to have better communication with my kids, if my goal is to not lash out with my emotions, if my goal in homeschooling is to, you know, get through these certain assignments, um, if my client's goals are to help you know, with anxiety, if everything that we are doing is working towards those goals, it's a, it's a something to go back to. It's a continual motivator. So I think setting goals with your family, um, maybe in all of these areas is very helpful. It's a great way for your kids to have continual motivation. What's your goal with this? You know, I know that you probably wouldn't be choosing to be doing homeschooling or to be doing school, right? But while we're doing it, what's your goal? Is it to jump to that next reading level? Is it to really understand this? Um, you know, communication. What's your goal with me? Is your goal for you not to get yelled at anymore? Okay, well, mommy's goal is to not yell at you either, right? Now we can hold each other accountable to those things. Now, when we are having a talk, it's for the purpose of that goal. And we can say, this is why we're doing this. It's so that we can get to this point, right? This is why we're doing that assignment because I know you said you really wanted to work towards this. Um, that carries over in every area of our life. So I think maybe starting there, having that to go back to, because I think almost everything we talked about essentially is meant to be a help towards those individual goals. And so, you know, for you moms, for you homeschoolers, you know, if your goal is to get through this um, and not just survive it, but learn how to excel, learn how to still enjoy your family, um, then, then set that time apart, create those goals to have family fun night once a week, to go do lessons in the park one day. You know, it's establishing those goals and knowing that it's okay to have these bigger goals beyond just getting that finish line, just trying to get to the end of May. Um, and sometimes that can be enough, um, but really getting that bigger picture. What do you want? What do you want with your family? What do you want from homeschooling? And your kids too, they've got goals. Um, they just might need help articulating them. Well, I think that is a wonderful advice. I um, want to thank you so much, Jill, for joining us today. You know, this has been a big help to me personally. I know it will be very helpful to our audience um, as well. So just a big thank you for taking the time and um, walking through some of these tips for us homeschooling families. Of course. Thank you guys so much for having me. It was my pleasure. Thank you guys. And we'll see you next session.